Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Joanna Lee. I'm the Vice President of Strategic Programs and Legal at the Linux Foundation and Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, I'm a, a lawyer by background, and um, I've been working in technology, open source, and open standards for, for quite some time. Um, and my happy place is very much at the intersection of business and economics, policy and law, and technology. Um, so today we'll talk about some of the legal risks and compliance challenges um, that generative AI uh, used for developing software, in particular open source software, presents. Um, and, uh, and then uh, I'll go through some practical guidance, both for open source developers and projects, and I'll, I'll touch briefly on what compliance looks like uh, within a company or organization. Um, in the audience here, we have Dan Lindbergh, who's really the expert on that. Um, so uh, if you have further questions about that, feel free to find uh, either of us in the hallways after this. So uh, I assume, how many people in the room are, are, are lawyers or have a legal or compliance background? OK, OK, great, great. But certainly not everybody. Um, since uh, we're not all lawyers, um, I'm going to go over a few copyright basics, um, and, and particularly in the context of AI. Um, so copyright is a form of intellectual property protection. It gives the owner of the copyright certain exclusive rights uh, in, a, in, a, in an authored work. Um, which could be literary, dramatic, a poem, and it could be software code. Uh, it could be images, artwork, et cetera. Um, and those are exclusive rights to distribute, reproduce, um, and, and do certain things with that copyrighted work. Um, and for a work to be copyrightable, it has to be, have been independently created by a human being. So that means not a monkey, not, uh, not, a, not an AI tool, yeah. Um, and it has to have some minimal degree of creativity. And what, what meets that minimum spark of creativity is going to really vary depending on the facts and you know, what court and what jurisdiction you're in. Copyright does not protect facts and ideas. It, it will protect the unique expression um, of an idea, but something like a mathematical formula or statistics or just raw facts, uh, those are not copyrightable. Um, you know, however, if you want to uh, turn a mathematical formula into some type of you know, poetic song, <laughs> that, that unique expression then could be subject to copyright. So um, we've discussed that only works that are um, created by a human, at, at least this is a current law in, in most jurisdictions, including the US and EU. Um, it has to be generated by a human in order to be, to be eligible for copyright protection. Now, what if there's a work that is uh, created in part using a machine and in part, use, using, uh, in part by a human? So let's say you use an AI tool. Um, you, know, you put a lot of creativity and thinking into what prompts you use. You take the code that's generated by that AI tool and you edit it. Uh, you edit it for suitability, reliability, et cetera the portions that you have contributed to that to the end product are eligible for copyright protection and at least that's the current law um, which you know could change um, so even though ai on its own can't be the author of a copyrighted work ai tools could infringe pre-existing um, copyrighted works of third parties. Um, so AI tools, obviously, they train on lots of data. They're going to train on a lot of pre-existing. Uh, if, they're, if they're designed to generate code, they're going to train on a lot of pre-existing code, which may be subject to third-party copyrights. Um, and if the AI tool reproduces any of that training data in its output, um, and there's not adequate permissions from the copyright holders or the license that applies that work isn't being complied with, uh, now we have a legal, legal uh, either a copyright infringement issue um, or a licensing compliance issue. And there is pending litigation, um, co-pilot litigation, Getty Images versus Stability AI, um, that, that relates to uh, this, this risk of uh, what's often accidental uh, copyright infringement. There's also some uncertainty about how copyright law applies to, uh, so we talked in the last slide about, uh, really about inference and the output, right? When the output uh, reproduces uh, training data. Um, there, is, there are questions about, is the training itself uh, actually an, uh, an, an act that requires a license if you're training on copyrighted works? Right, um, and without a license, is that infringement? 
Um, there are some legal doctrines in various jurisdictions. In the US, there's this doctrine of fair use. Uh, in the EU, there is a text and data mining exception. Um, you know, there's, there's not absolute certainty yet about um, does training of an AI on copyrighted works, is that, is that fair use? Does it qualify for an exception? Or is that n not even considered reproduction in the first place? Um, and uh, uh, and the, the best practices that we're going to talk about later don't necessarily try and solve this issue because it's still quite ambiguous. But we are going to talk about, um, we are going to talk about the licensing and copyright issues at, at, the, at the inference and, and output stage. Um, so we talked already a little bit about the copyright concerns. There's also a license compatibility issue. So let's say you're using um, an AI model that's trained on uh, pre-existing code that is subject to a variety of licenses. They could even all be open source licenses. But some of that code that it's tr trained on might be uh, licensed under the GPL, which is a copyleft license. Uh, some of it might be licensed under Apache um, or uh, BSD, which are permissive licenses. And so if you're taking that code um, that's uh, in the AI output and you're contributing it to an open source project, um, you have to make sure that the, the license that apply to um, that output is, is compatible uh, with the open source project that you are, you are contributing to. Um, there are some other challenges uh, regarding uh, licensing compliance. So currently, most AI tools don't actually let you know when the output is similar to data that it was trained on. Um, and if you don't know what co pre-existing code has been reproduced, and you don't know what license terms apply to it, how are you going to comply with the, the license terms, right? Um, there are some even open source uh, licenses, including GPL, that have certain um, disclosure requirements around so making source code available, right? Um, and uh, obviously, you can't comply with the terms of a license if you don't what, know what the license terms are. So that's one challenge with, with many AI tools today. Uh, we will talk a little bit about how the AI tools are, are evolving, though, to enable enable compliance. Um, this also presents a challenge when generating SBOMs. Um, if, sorry, hair, <laughs> hair and microphone issues. Um, so if you don't know the origin of the code that's being produced by an AI tool, how can you generate a complete and accurate SBOM, right? And this is not just a legal issue. As you all know, this is a software supply chain and security vulnerability tracking issue as well. Uh, there are some other uh, challenges that are unique to open source software. Um, so uh, here's an example of uh, terms and conditions of an AI tool that aren't actually consistent with the open source definition. So uh, for example, uh, open AI terms and conditions uh, don't just apply to your use of open AI tools. It, there are some provisions that also apply to your use of the output. So the output, uh, if you use ChatGPT, another open AI tool, uh, I'm just going to read these couple of examples. You may not use a service to develop foundation models or other large scale models that compete with open AI. So a restriction on developing competitive models using ChatGPT output. Um, another restriction, public content created in part using open AI may not be related to political campaigns, adult content, spam, hateful content, content that incites violence, or other uses that may cause social harm. And we're seeing these you know, ethics and, and uh, social harm restriction clauses in, in lots of licenses now for, for AI tools. Um, and while these are certainly you know, legitimate, uh, legitimate provisions to put in a contract, um, they are not consistent with the open source definition. So if you take content generated using an open AI tool and you contribute it to an open source project, there's already an incompatibility between the, your contractual obligations to OpenAI um, and uh, the license terms of the project, which are all subject to the open source definition. Because the open source definition requires, in order for it to qualify as open source, um, there can't be restrictions on the, the field of use, um, on uh, using the program in a specific field of endeavor. Uh, there can't be restrictions on who can use it. So a restriction on developing com competing products or a restriction on doing things that, that, that would be socially harmful, um, you know, while those are maybe you know, notable from, a, from, a, from an ethics perspective, they don't meet the definition of uh, open source. 
Also, it, is AI-generated content, uh, if you take that and, gener and, and contribute to a project that uses the developer certificate of origin, there's also a question about if, if there's consistency there. So um, the developer certificate of origin requires when you make a contribution that you are certifying that one of these, one of these provisions here um, are, are true. So uh, paragraph A is uh, saying that the contribution was created in whole or in part by you and that you have the right to submit it under the open source license indicated in the file. Um, if, the, if the contribution was created wholly by an, op, uh, by a, an AI tool, um, it wasn't created in whole or in part by you. Now, if you edited it and you've made your own human contributions to it, then it was created at least in part by you. Um, paragraph B, the contribution is based upon previous work that to the best of my knowledge is covered under an appropriate open source license and I have the rights um, essentially to, to contribute it under the license indicated in the file. Again, if you're using a tool that is reproducing pre-existing works in its output and you don't know uh, the origin of those pre-existing works or what license terms apply, um, you can't actually, you can't uh, actually certify that paragraph B is true, right? Um, there are analogous, uh, similar concerns with uh, contributor license agreements, including the Apache CLA, which is perhaps the most commonly used CLA that, for projects, um, where you're being asked as a, as a contributor to make certain certifications. And uh, if you're using AI-generated content, it's not totally clear that, that you can make these uh, representations. There are also evolving laws and regulations in this area. Um, earlier in the, in the summer, ChatGPT was temporarily banned in Italy um, due, to, due to a privacy uh, issue. Um, there's uh, legislation in the EU, Artificial Intelligence Act. Um, there's an executive order uh, that was recently issued in the US. This regulation is, is coming um, in, in, a, in, a, in, in a range of jurisdictions, um, and that's going to subject AI providers and AI users um, including uh, open source uh, AI models um, to a number of compliance obligations. Uh, another concern that doesn't so much apply in, in the context of an open source project because everything is out in the open and we're not really dealing with trade secrets when we're doing collaborative open source development, but something that's very, very important uh, inside a company when you're developing proprietary software um, is the, tra the, the risk of trade secret loss. So for example, if you ask ChatGPT for um, you know, advice on how to treat your sore throat, um, and then your neighbor asks ChatGPT, is, is my neighbor not feeling well? ChatGPT is not required to keep your personal medical information secret, right? Or if you ask for you know, marital counseling and advice, and your neighbor says, oh, is, is, you know, is uh, Joanna over there having you know, issues in her marriage? ChatGPT does not have to keep that secret. Similarly, if you're a company and you're feeding in the prompts, let's say proprietary code and asking ChatGPT or a similar tool, uh, you know, can you please uh, help identify bugs in here for me? Or if you're feeding it, um, uh, you know, meeting transcripts or, or, or recording of a meeting and asking it to generate uh, a transcript. Um, that, if, if that's confidential information, ChatGPT is learning from the prompts that you feed ChatGPT and is not required to keep that secret. Um, so that is a, a major concern inside companies that are using AI tools that are provided uh, by, by third-party vendors. Yes, <laughs> The good news is that these are not, for the most part, these are not brand new problems in open source, right? Uh, even even you know, 10 years ago today, a developer can go to Stack Overflow and copy code that they really shouldn't be copying and then contribute it to an open source project without permission, without appropriate license, without a compatible license, right? That can happen today. Um, but when you're using an AI tool, um, it's introducing that risk at a systematized, broader scale, and without necessarily, I mean, it, 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 a contributor who does that, they, they shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> and hopefully that's happening very, very rarely. But there are some you know, people who are new to open source that, that don't really understand how licensing works. So, um, but with an AI tool, it, it introduces that risk at a, at a, in a much more systematized way. Um, I just also want to point out, although this talk is focused really on using generative AI to uh, create software, 
Um, there are obviously other types of content that can be generated using AI. And depending on the type of content, I think the risks are slightly different. So with, uh, so for example, with images, graphic and art, so our artwork, um, that's almost always going to be subject to copyright protection. Uh, documentation and blogs, um, you know, even though that may be subject to copyright protection, um, the, 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 tra the, the output and the training materials, um, it's relatively easy, right, to fix documentation, take a Donna blog, if you get notice from a copyright holder, hey, this is infringing my content. Whereas with software and code, because of dependencies, um, it's not always that easy to just remove the allegedly infringing content if you learn about it. Uh, so uh, how do we manage all these risks? Uh, well, first I'm going to focus on the guidance for open source projects and contributors. Um, and there's a lot of overlap. And many of these best practices apply within an organization and company um, as well. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, tra managing trade secret um, leakage risk inside a company. Um, so best practice guidance point number one. Uh, use AI to augment your efforts not to replace your, your judgment or thinking. Um, Make sure you're reviewing and, and editing any content uh, generated using AI tools for quality, reliability, suitability, compatibility, et cetera. Um, and, you know, and that's both because, uh, I mean, remember that AI tools train on data that's not perfect, right? They can be training on code that has bugs, errors, vulnerabilities, um, et cetera, and that can be reproduced in, in the output. So you, you still need to check uh, the output. Um, also, uh, for the copyright and DCO and CLA reasons we talked about earlier, um, if, you have, if you have contributed at least edits or some, some uh, of your own thinking and content, um, then that, that resolves the, the issues around consistency with the DCO. Um, and uh, at least part of that contribution could be subject to, to copyright. Also review the terms and conditions of the AI tool. So in the earlier uh, example for the open AI terms and conditions, um, you know, I, I, we, we uh, looked at a couple of provisions that are inconsistent with open source definition. Um, so, uh, but there are, there are tools that don't restrict, uh, place restrictions on use of the output that would be inconsistent with the, uh, with the open source definition. So it just depends on the tool. Um, this is this is not new with AI. Whenever you are, whenever you are reproducing pre-existing uh, software code and then contributing it to open source project, uh, you know, or or just or using it in a proprietary product, you, know, you provide notice and attribution, right? Notice uh, to the copyright holders, um, notice of what license applies to it, etc. So uh, also it. If you are using an AI tool that enables compliance, um, utilize th those features. So for example, um, some AI tools, including AWS Code Whisper and GitHub Copilot, include optional features that you can turn on um, that either, either allow you to filter out um, from the output and recommendations code that's similar to pre-existing third-party code um, so you're, you're not even shown suggestions that, that reproduce the training data. Or um, you can instead elect to have those suggestions shown to you, um, but, uh, but turn on what's called a code referencing feature where it will, it will let you know, hey, this suggestion matches code that exists in, in and they'll provide you with a list of the repositories. Um, and then you can go to the repositories and, and see what the terms of the, the licenses are. Um, and these features aren't, turned, aren't usually turned on automatically, so you have to go into the tool settings to turn them on. Um, but I do encourage use of these tools because it resolves a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, licensing compliance and, and copyright issues. Uh, so what happens when the tool flags multiple matches? Um, so you might be using a code referencing uh, feature in, in, in a tool like uh, Copilot, and uh, you get a list of like 10, 20, 50 <laughs> matches, right? What do you do with that? Do you have to 
provide notice and attribution with your contribution of every single match? No, you don't. <laughs> so I mean, even today, if you were to copy directly from any one of those repositories, you are not required to do research on what other, you know, what other software programs throughout the world uh, is this also a potential match to. You only have to provide notice and attribution to one. Um, and how do you go about choosing which one? Um, well, at least at the, at the Linux Foundation and CNCF, we're not, we're not telling developers how they need to go about selecting one, but here are some examples of at least what's happening in companies regarding their policies uh, for, for, for which uh, program you provide attribution to. So you could go with the very oldest match, think, you know, and the thinking behind that is maybe that was the original one and all the other programs had copied from that source, right? So that's one way of going about it. Um, you could choose you know, any match that has a compatible license, um, the oldest match with a compatible license, uh, you know, or you could just select one randomly. Um, Do and is, is this the Linux Foundation, I mean, is this uh, formally the Linux Foundation's guidance? So the Linux Foundation has published much higher level guidance that essentially says, and it's available in the policy section of the Linux Foundation website, that basically says, please check the terms and conditions of the tool you're using. And secondly, you know, if, if you know that the output uh, includes pre-existing third-party materials, please provide notice and attribution and, um, and uh, comply with the terms of license. Now within CNCF, we're working on a much more um, comprehensive guidance document that's going to include essentially all the content in these slides. So um, you will see you will see these these options uh, in the CNCF guidance when it's published, probably sometime early next year. Um, so what if the tool you're using doesn't include uh, features that enable compliance? Um, well, there are, other, there are other ways of getting comfortable that you're not inadvertently infringing third-party copyrights. Um, and that's using existing practices and tools that are, that are used in open source compliance today. So one is snippet comparison scanning, you know, using a tool like, for example, like, uh, uh, like Black Duck. Uh, many companies, uh, that's just part of their routine compliance. Uh, check that they subject uh, software to uh, code uh, to its code scan before before it goes into production or, or even earlier uh, in the during the development process. Um, also, you know, if you if you talk to your company counsel, you know, they they might advise you this this AI generated outputs not even if it were produced by a human would not be subject to copyright protection anyway. So if it's not copyrightable, you don't actually need a license. Um, it's it's public. It's equivalent to being public domain. Um, for example, if the, the code is really just a very simple expression of a mathematical equation, a very simple function, if there's not some, again, there has to be some minimum spark of creativity in order for it to even be subject to uh, copyright protection. Um, also, maybe, maybe you're using an AI model that was you know, completely you know, developed within your organization. And so if you're familiar with how it was trained and how it's generating uh, suggestions, um, for example, it was only trained on you know internal um, internal proprietary code. Um, if you're at, if you're at an organization that has that that much code, um, that that might be another basis for for getting comfortable that you're not you're not accidentally infringing third party rights. Also, um, consider and it, this is not necessarily a, this is not a requirement. Um, I, I wouldn't even necessarily say that for, for in the open source uh, project context, it's necessarily even a best practice yet, but this is becoming a very common practice within organizations um, where when you are using an AI tool and you're including its output uh, in code you're developing, um, you include either in the file or in the commit comments um, a, a notice or a tag that says this is generated uh, in part using AI tools. In some organizations, uh, you might also include the prompts and identify which tool you're using so that it's in the history. Um, and that, does, that accomplishes a few things. Um, one is that uh, if, if your organization ever does want to um, register for copyright protection, you know, there's this record of uh, there's this record of the, the prompt history, um, and then uh, so some companies will even have you um, add, you know, uh, will even um, record logs of uh, what the output was and then what your, e what your edits were. So that, um, I, just, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily, a, a, 
That's not a universal practice, but it is, it is a practice uh, observed in some companies. Um, and so within it, an open source project context, um, if you as a contributor um, add that information, um, you're actually enabling downstream compliance because those tags that say this is generated in part using AI, um, many adopters, uh, many companies are subjecting uh, files and code that is tagged as AI generated to an additional compliance review. Whether that is a personal legal department looking at it um, or it's going through an additional uh, scan uh, for compliance. Uh, and comply with the policies of your employer. Uh, many, many organizations have more stringent guidelines than what uh, some projects, you know, I, I think there's probably a minority of open source projects that actually have guidance um, published already for how to responsibly, at least from a legal uh, perspective, contribute uh, AI-generated content. Um, but, but more and more will. So make sure you're, you familiarize yourself with the policies of the project you're contributing to. But also, if your employer has more stringent guidelines, um, comply with those as well. Um, so here are some additional considerations for what AI compliance looks like inside an organization. Um, there are the approaches to what AI compliance looks like within companies and organizations really varies widely. In some ways, it looks a lot like what open source compliance looked like in companies in the late 90s and early 2000s, where there was a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there are companies today that completely prohibit use of generative AI tools for whether for code development or for, for any purpose. Um, and you just like in the late 90s and early 2000s, if a company prohibits their developers from using open source code, guess what? Your developers probably are using it anyway, right? <laughs> um, and I think that's probably the same with AI tools. So uh, I'm, I'm definitely more of a fan of uh, don't prohibit it, just educate and provide guidance on how to do, how to do this responsibly. Uh, many companies uh, allow use of generative AI tools, but only tools that have been vetted and selected by the company and the company has a license to. Um, some companies will permit use of generative AI um, just for certain uses and contexts, but not others. For example, they might uh, have a policy that says you can use generative AI for, um, you know, for, for bug fixes, um, and, but you can't use it to generate you know, shiny new features because we really need to make sure that those are, um, you know, those are copyrightable. Um, and uh, many companies will allow use of generative AI, AI tools, but they will subject the, uh, the AI output that's included in code uh, to additional compliance checks and reviews. Um, and then there are some companies that only allow it uh, by developers with certain credentials and training. Um, and that's, that's for a couple of reasons. One is to make sure that whoever is using the AI tools you know, does actually understand what these best practices are and company policies and how to use them. And then secondly, um, the thinking is often that um, you know, a really, really junior developer who hasn't yet like, develop, doesn't have a lot of experience may not yet have the judgment to really critically review the output of an AI tool, whereas a more senior developed, uh, more, more senior experienced developer um, is going to be able to review that more, more critically. Um, so some of the commonly used methods for minimizing trade, the trade secret risk, um, you know, and this continues to evolve, um, are restrictions and types of information that can be used in prompts given to AI tools. Um, so some companies will say, well, you know, you, you can feed the AI tool with these types of prompts, but please don't put confidential meeting minutes or proprietary code in there. Uh, uh, some companies will restrict the length um, of prompts, so restrict it to a certain number of characters, and that way uh, that helps ensure that you know, an entire, all, you know, all the code for a proprietary program isn't getting fed into the, into the uh, tool without, without proper authorization. Um, some are using models that have you know, filters or, um, or restrictions on, on the model's ability to learn from the, the prompts. Um, and uh, a, a common model is really around um, the hosting and deployment, um, using LLMs that are self-hosted, owned, and controlled. So they, 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 they know where the data is going. Um, so one example of this, Hugging Face announced uh, its safe coder. Uh, tool uh, recently, um, and the way this works is it's um, they're offering LLMs 
that are trained on permissively licensed data. Um, so they come pre-trained, but then the company will fine tune that LLM on their own internal proprietary software. So you're get, they're getting the sort of the best of both worlds, right? It's already had, been trained on a broader um, set of data, um, but getting fine tuned for that company's uh, purposes. Um, and then that model is going to sit on a, it, it is going to be entirely self hosted and maintained. Um, and the data is never going to leave their own virtual private cloud. And that prevents, that, that, that prevents uh, the accidental trade secret leakage. Um, I also just want to note that all, because the laws and um, the technology itself are evolving so rapidly, um, you know, anything that's been described as guidance or best practices here you know, very well could change in six months, you know, even three months. Um, so it's, it's important if, uh, if you develop a policy, either as an open source community or as a company, that you're constantly reviewing and iterating. So are we, are we out of time or do we have time for questions? Okay, okay. Well, I'll, I'll be around, so happy to chat with any of you in the hallway. Uh, thank you.